thoughts and prayers as we pray. Let's certainly remember them and those who are about to undergo procedures. So let's uh, be sure to uh, pray for those also. But we appreciate very much you, you being here today. Let me cut this off. This is too loud, I know. But uh, we're glad that you're here, and we hope and trust as we study together for a bit that our studies will be profitable and beneficial. What better way to begin a new year than to assemble with the people of God to worship and serve our God. And so we're certainly thankful that we have this opportunity that we can come and we can worship God together. I want to talk to you about a story that's related to us in the Bible. It's a parable. It's one that we can see that we have a successful farmer who in the end really failed, and he failed miserably as we study together about this. And the story is found in Luke 12, verses 13 through verses 21. So you can turn there. You can simply follow along on the screen. It's there that then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? And so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, So do you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, one of the things that obviously that we can see in this, we can see why he states this parable to them. Here's a man from an audience, this crowd that gather. He says, tell my brother to divide this inheritance with me. And obviously this was an older brother. He's the one that possibly had control of the inheritance. And yet he wants the division of that inheritance immediately, and he wanted to share this. And it's pretty apparent from the story itself that this man was covetous because this is the reason why the Lord said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. There's something else in this parable that stands out to me as well concerning this man who asked him to divide, tell his brother to divide this inheritance with him. He said, so is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Was this individual rich toward God? Or what was he more concerned about? He was more concerned about his physical inheritance than he was his spiritual inheritance that he could possess in heaven as a result of his loving and serving the Lord. Now this is one of the problems that we see in society that we live in today, that there are more people that are concerned with the physical things, the material things, than they are the spiritual things. That's very obvious when you just simply take a glance at their lives and see what really matters to them, what really matters to you. You can tell a lot about yourself when you see what really matters to you. What do you put first in your life? Is the Lord first? Do you put him first? Do you love him and serve him? Is he always first and foremost in your life? Or could it describe us that we're covetous and that we're not treasuring up spiritual things and we're not rich toward God? Now let me suggest some things to you of why this farmer failed. One of the first things that you can see is, is where he sought counsel from. Now, where was it that he sought counsel from? Did you see that in the text as we read? Well, it's pretty apparent when we read what was said within the text. He said, and he thought within himself. Now, who decided this? He did. Where did he look? Himself? Is that where we need to look? Oh, certainly we need to examine ourselves, but we need to examine ourselves in light of the Word of God. The Word of God needs to play a prominent role in our lives. So here's a man that thought within himself and sang. You know, he was thinking about retiring, wasn't he? And he was thinking about retiring without God. He wasn't concerned about God and serving God. You know, the answer does not lie within self. Naaman is a great example of this as well. You remember, this is a Syrian man 
he was the commander of the Syrian king's army. But the Bible says there in 2 Kings 5 that he was a leper. He had the disease of leprosy. You remember they had made some invasions into the land of Israel. And, of course, they had captured this Israelite girl. And this Israelite girl was serving Naaman's wife in this household. And she goes to Naaman's wife, and she tells Naaman's wife, said, you know, there's a prophet in Samaria. If he would go and see this prophet, he could be healed of his leprosy. And he does. He goes to Samaria. But he approaches the king initially, and the king is kind of upset that he would come to him. And eventually Elisha hears of this, and so he sends and brings Naaman to him. Now the amazing thing about this is that Elisha doesn't even go out to him. He sends a message to him. It said that Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger to him. He didn't go out. Here's your message. Here's what you need to do. He said, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself. This is what I think. This is what I think. This is how I can be healed of my leprosy. Is that how he was healed? Because of what he thought. Or was he healed when he listened to the man of God and when he went and dipped seven times in the Jordan? See, answers are not within ourselves. What you and I have to do is we have to make sure that we seek counsel from God. You know, the Bible is pretty plain. There's a number of passages that we can look at. Proverbs 14, verses 12 said, There is a way which seems, that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. It may seem right, it may feel right, I may think it's right, but unless God has said it, then it will end in my spiritual death and spiritual separation from God. Jeremiah 10, verse 23, said, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. You can't direct your steps without God's instructions to God. You have to listen to God. You have to do what God tells you to do. The Bible supplies the answers for life. In Psalms 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, the psalmist said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now who is the man that's blessed? Who is the man that shall bring forth its fruit in its season? Who is the man whose leaf shall not wither? And who is the man that whatever he does, that he's going to prosper in what he does? It's the man that listens to God. It's the man that follows the instruction that's given by God in his word. That's the person that is going to be prosperous. Now, he's not talking about being prosperous materially, but he's talking about being prosperous spiritually. He's talking about being able to live eternally with God. That's the person that's going to live with God. You know, the word of God completely supplies us spiritually. He said all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable. Beneficial, you might say, is another word. For doctrine, it will teach you. For reprove, it'll reprove you. It'll tell you how to correct that which is wrong. It'll give you instruction of how to live righteous. He said that the man of God may be complete, lacking in nothing. He said thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every work that God approves of that's good is contained within the scriptures themselves. And so that's the reason that the word of God is given to us. Peter said this in 2 Peter 1 and verses 3. As his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. His divine power is his word. And it's given through, it come, this is how you can gain a knowledge of him. Everything of how to live godly is supplied to us within the scriptures themselves. And so this farmer failed because of where he sought counsel. But let me suggest something else to you. One of the things that he failed in doing, and that was in helping others as well. 
He didn't help others like he should. You know, the child of God is the person that really is ready and willing to help others. And think about that with me for just a moment. I want you to notice something that was said. Look at what is said concerning this man. See that? What do you see there? I and mine. How many times is I used? Six times. My, five times. Not counting some other things that's said within there. He, you know, thought within himself. There's he and himself. You know, other such expressions like this. So now who was he really concerned with? Was he concerned about anybody else? Or was he simply concerned about himself? Well, the person that he was concerned about in this particular text, we can see, was himself. He wasn't concerned about anybody else. But you know, the child of God is concerned about helping other people. God's people are willing to help others. That's what he wants us to do. In Galatians 6, in verses 10, he said, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. He said, especially to those of the household of faith. Now, the more I study this context, I think this context is talking about spiritually speaking. There are spiritual things that we can do for all people. But certainly there are some other principles that are involved throughout the Scriptures. There are materially things that we can help and provide for as well. But whatever way we can provide help for others, then certainly we need to do that as we have opportunity. And we have a lot of opportunities. And he tells us that we need to do good. What better thing could you do for an individual than to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can save their souls by the grace of God? You know, that's one of the things that we can do. We can encourage people. We can help strengthen people and build people up. And we can even reprove them and rebuke them when that's needed as, as well. But we can do that in a kind, loving, and generous way. So God's people are willing to help others. They're not just concerned about themselves. They're concerned about others. Now I want you to look at the context of the setting of this parable called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law and what is your reading of it? You know, what's, what's said in the law? And, and how do you understand what's written in the law? What, what, what does the law say? What does the law teach? And how do you understand that, the, the law and what the law is teaching on this subject? And so he answered and said, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now there's his understanding of what the law says. But now he needed to apply that. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor then? You know what the Jew thought a neighbor was, didn't you? He was only another Jew. It wasn't a Gentile at all. They didn't want anything to do with the Gentile people. Is that the only person that's a neighbor who is a Jew, if you were a Jew? You know, and then he studied the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here's a man that went down from the city of Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's beaten and left for dead. Let's just say, for instance, for the sake of argument, that this was a Jew. Now, there was two men who passed by. They went on the other side. You didn't want to get close to him, you know. Now, who were those two other men? They were Jews. One was a Levite, one was a priest. But here comes another man. This is a Samaritan. This is the one that the Jews despised. And he's the one that stopped and helped. He's the one that took oil and wine and bound up his wounds. He's the one that placed him on his animal. He's the one that took him to the inn. He's the one that paid the innkeeper, and he told the innkeeper, if, he, if there's any more charge other than this, he said, I'll pay you when I come back. Now then, he asked him, which one of these three was your neighbor? Oh, he said, I suppose the one that helped. Oh, you've answered rightly. Go and do likewise. There's the answer. See, the child of God is the one who is a neighbor. He's the good Samaritan. He's the one that's willing to help, and he's not just concerned about self. He's concerned about others. You realize that even part of judgment will be based on the good deeds that we do? So then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me uh, food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. He said, I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, 
Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he states the opposite of this in the next few verses. And then, of course, judgment will be the separation of the sheep from the goats. And those who did not do will be condemned. It's the person who acted. It's the person who did these good deeds that will be rewarded for eternal life. That's at least part of what judgment will be based upon. But this man didn't help others. He was only concerned about himself. I'll tell you something else of why he failed, and that is because of the fact that he forgot death. He forgot about all, all about death and dying. He said, and I will say to my soul, said, so do you have many goods laid up for many years? You know, I've got a lot of years. I'm going to retire. One of the saddest things I ever encountered when Sylvia and I first moved to Nashville, there was a man who came to me and told me, he and his wife, he said, I've got, we've got a mother-in-law's apartment on our house that nobody's living in. He said, you, you and Sylvia and Marshall can live there until you get your house built on one condition. I said, okay. He said, I don't want to hear anything about money. He said, this is all free. Sylvia and I got up on every morning and she had fresh vegetables laying at our door. They did everything. She cooked dinner for us at night. Did everything for us. And they would not take any money at all. He retired when he was 65. And he told me he kind of feared retiring because he knew another fellow that retired that he worked with and he lived six months. He retired at 65. He had a procedure done at the hospital and I was there with the family when he had that procedure. And I knew when the doctor walked in that it was bad news because he had his head dropped and he wouldn't even look, hardly look at the family. He had a tiny speck on his lung and they were going to remove that and they simply closed him back up and they told him that he had six months to live and that's exactly what he lived. He retired at 65 and lived six months. See, death happens to those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous as well. We have to remember death. Death comes to all as it is appointed for men to die once and after this the judgment. Every one of us will die. In Genesis 3, verses 19, here's the reason why. He said, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and dust you shall return. That's part of the punishment for the sins that Adam committed. And this is what God says to Adam. He said, this is what you're going to do. He said, you're going to uh, have sweat of your head. You're going to have to work and labor for your food. But he said, you're going to die. And he said, you're going to return to the dust. If you read the book of Genesis and Genesis 5, and you're going to notice numbers of times throughout that, and he died, and he died, and he died. It emphasized the fact that, yes, we will die. It's going to happen to all of us. And you see, this rich farmer, he forgot all about that. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verses 22, he said, For as in Adam all die. He's talking about physical death. He said, And so also in Christ shall all be made alive. All will rise from the dead in Christ. But the point is that all of us will die. Every single one of us. And in Christ will rise to answer God in judgment. The righteous along with the unrighteous. And Mo so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. He was a righteous man. And here's a righteous man that died. Here's a righteous man that was taken up to the Mount Moab and he got to see the promised land, but he couldn't enter in because of the sin. But that doesn't mean that he didn't enter into his eternal rest. He simply didn't enter into the promised land. But here's a righteous man that died. Moses' name is mentioned over 850 times in the scripture. That's quite a bit, isn't it? And so you can see how righteous and upright he was. In Acts 12, verses 21 through 23, here we have Herod. Herod Antipas I is who this is describing. It said so, and he's the one that had James beheaded, you remember? He said so on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, and because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. See, righteous and unrighteous die. 
It's an appointment that we all will keep. And we need to remember that. We need to keep that ever before. Do you know special attention was paid to those that were righteous? And said, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Didn't say anything about angels coming and taking him anywhere, did he? But I'm going to tell you, the righteous Lazarus died, and he was taken by angels to Abraham's bosom. Acts 7, verses 55 and 60, talking about Stephen. He said, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Then in verse 60, he said, then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The Lord was paying close attention to the fact of Stephen giving his life as a martyr for his cause. See, special attention is given to those who are righteous. But we all will die. Let me suggest something to you. You know, he failed in considering his soul as well. He did have a soul. He said, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, foo, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? See, there is an inward and an outward man. Soul is used here talking about life, basically. But there's something beyond life here that he, he didn't consider. And that was his eternal soul or his eternal spirit. You know, one can lose their soul. In Matthew 10, verses 28, it said, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body or both soul and body in hell. Say, I have a body, but I also have a soul or spirit. There's an inward being that will live on throughout all eternity, and I can lose my soul. In Matthew 16, in verses 26, he said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What are we willing to give in exchange for our soul? Material things? A little pleasure? Not putting God first and foremost in my life? Am I willing to lose my soul to have ease, to have material prosperity, to have power or prominence? Or am I willing to submit to God and be faithful and loyal to Him? You know, the Bible also reveals to us what it means to lose one's soul. Now, I'm not trying to distinguish between Hades in this particular verse and hell, Gehenna. The only difference I can see between those, and the lower part of that, would be one is, one is temporary and the other is permanent. But I want you to know, it said so... It was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom and was read just a moment ago. But he said that the rich man also died and was buried and being in torments in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things Likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Now, that's what it means to lose your soul. It's not like some that they say, well, that when you die and if you're lost, you're, you just cease to exist. You're annihilated. No, that's, that's not true. That's not what the scripture says. This rich man knew that he was in torments. And he knew that it was an awful place. And he actually asked, I've got five brothers, send somebody back to warn them so that they won't come to this awful place. And the answer to that was, the Lord said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no. He said, they won't hear them, but they'll hear someone if he rises from dead. He said, no, they won't hear me. And there's a lot of people that won't listen to what the Lord said. And this is what it means to lose my soul. I'll be separated for all eternity from the grace and goodness of God and I'll suffer punishment or being torments forever and forever and forever. That's what it means to lose my soul. But let me suggest something else to you. You know, one of the things that he failed in, and that is in acknowledging that God is and that God exists. So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. 
Was there anything said about his relationship with God? Did he believe God was and that God exists? Did he honor God in any way? No, he wasn't rich toward God at all. You know, he was just concerned about tearing down his barns and building greater, greater barns so that he could have material prosperity and so that he could sit back and take his ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That's what he was concerned about. So he didn't acknowledge God at all. You know, plans without God are doomed to failure. That's, that's for sure. He said, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. He said, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Something I've overlooked in this for a good number of years, I think, is the connection between what's said in verse 17 with what's said from verses 13 through 16. What is it that I know to do good? Doing good is including God in your plans. And if I don't do good, I'm not including God in my plans. That's the connection here. Oh, I understand that there's some other far-reaching application to that, but that's the application that James makes here. You have plans for tomorrow? If you do, you better make sure that God's included in them. That's what he's telling us. They're doomed to failure without God in them. That's what happened to this prodigal son. So that not many days after the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. His older brother set on prostitutes. He said, but when he had spent all, he said, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Swine were unclean animals to the Jews. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swines ate unclean animal. He was not only willing to take care of them, but even eat with them. He said, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger? He said, I'm going to rise. I'm going to go to my father. He said, I'm going to tell my father. He said, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven and earth. Forgive me. And his father forgave him. The father in this story is God, the father. See what happened to the prodigal son when he left his father's house and his father's security? When he failed to acknowledge his father, the same thing can happen to us. Now then I want you to think. I want you to, as we close the lesson, I want you to notice what the Lord says about this man. But God said to him, fool. You're a fool. Now, I didn't say that. God said that. The Lord said that. The Lord said that those that are more concerned about their material possessions than they are serving God, they're fools. Because you're going to lose the only thing that you have that is of any value, and that is your soul. Your soul is far too valuable not to put God first in your life. If you're not a Christian, what is it that's keeping you from becoming one? It has to be you. We're willing and ready to help you in whatever way we can. Are you willing to believe that Jesus is the Christ? You obviously believe that or else I don't think you would be here today. But are you willing to repent of your sins and to confess your faith in the Lord? Be baptized in water for remission of your sins, as the Bible instructs. It's the fool who refuses to do that. And if you've done that and you've wandered away from the fold of Satan, come back to the Lord. Make your life right with God. We'll pray with and for you as you repent of those things and confess them freely and openly to the Lord, then the Lord certainly will forgive you and cleanse you. So if we're here to help you in whatever way we can. So if you're subject, make your way to the front and let your wishes be made known. Stand together and sing this evening.